Hi, this is Professor Leslie Braun. Join us on the 2nd and 9th of May 2023 for our two part Four Perspectives episode on pain and inflammation. In this fascinating discussion, the FX Medicine Ambassadors and I will take you through the landscape of chronic pain and inflammation from both a biomedical and naturopathic perspective. We'll take a deep dive into common conditions associated with pain and inflammation and how to manage them using natural medicines. Also, we'll bring you the latest research, practice points and prescribing solutions, as well as important conversations around the psychology of pain. These are definitely two episodes you won't want to miss. Subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media to make sure you never miss an episode. Hi, and welcome to FX Medicine, where we bring you the latest in evidence-based integrative, functional, and complementary medicine. FX Medicine acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, where we live and work, and their connection to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. With us today is Professor Peter Drummond, who is a professor in psychology at Murdoch University in Western Australia. Peter is a prolific researcher with a specific interest in the biopsychosocial mechanisms associated with chronic pain, headaches, and migraines, and the psychophysiology of emotions and their impact on health. He teaches health psychology and behavioral medicine in the clinical psychology program at Murdoch University, and has supervised many PhD students throughout his career. In fact, Peter was my PhD supervisor when I completed it several years ago, and he continues to be involved in many of the research projects I conduct where he offers valuable advice and support. Okay, welcome to FX Medicine, Peter. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Now, I know that you have a specific expertise in chronic pain and headaches and migraines, so these are the areas I wanted to talk with you about today, in particular the area of psychology of pain. So, you know, from my years of experience working as a clinical psychologist, I know that pain, and in particular chronic pain, its causes and its treatments are often complex, and there are many factors that can affect pain. Can you just briefly tell us how psychology can possibly affect pain? Both our thoughts and our emotions affect pain. In fact, in the International Association for Study of Pain's definition, they state that pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling actual or potential tissue damage. So they are emphasising the role of emotions in our experience of pain and our thoughts obviously influence our emotional experience. So in a sense, the sensory aspects of pain and the emotional aspects of pain are combined to give us our experience of what pain actually is. It's, it's very difficult to separate one from the other, the sensation of pain and the emotional response to pain. So the particular types of thoughts, they can affect how we perceive the pain and, and there's the severity of the pain sensation? Exactly. Most people have heard about instances of soldiers in battle who suffer quite severe injuries but nevertheless don't experience pain on the battlefield and that pain then starts to develop once they're safe. So we have uh, inbuilt physiological processes within our nervous system that help us to modify the experience of pain. In this case, extreme fear is enough to switch pain off, but equally we have a capacity to amplify or facilitate pain. And uh, we do this also in part through the emotions that we're experiencing at the time that we're also experiencing pain. So anticipatory anxiety by and large will increase painful sensations. You might have experienced this yourself if you're waiting to be jabbed for a COVID vaccine, for instance. Uh, while you're waiting there anticipating a painful sensation, uh, you can feel the emotions actually building. And those emotions will intensify any painful sensations that happen at or around the time that we're we're expecting to experience pain. 
we as parents uh, use this strategy with kids. If they hurt themselves, if they fall over, we attempt to distract them to get them to think about something other than falling down and hurting themselves in a way to minimise pain. So I think that there's a very clear understanding out there in the in the community about the link between emotions and pain. Um, mm. And this comes to the forefront, really, uh, when we're trying to help people whose pain becomes chronic. So can you actually see, like, if you have a particular thoughts or particular emotions, can you actually, through, say, MRIs or whatever, that you can see differences in how the brain kind of reacts to pain based upon different thoughts and emotions? Well, you know, the fMRI researchers talk about a so-called pain matrix, and this consists of parts of the brain that are receiving signals from our so-called nociceptive system, and those signals go through the thalamus to the somatosensory cortex and also to additional parts of the cerebral cortex which are telling us about how intense the um, painful experience is and where it's coming from. But at the same time, the uh, emotional parts of the brain are active and this can be seen on uh, magnetic resonance imaging equipment. In particular, the anterior cingulate cortex, the prefrontal cortex, which are involved in... uh, working out what we should do to a threat or a potential threat, very active during pain. So it's uh, Mm -hmm. quite clear on neuroimaging that both emotional parts of the brain and uh, so-called sensory parts of the brain are simultaneously active. And so is it anxiety? You know, if we think about from the emotional perspective, is it the anxiety that will kind of exacerbate pain or is it kind of low mood and depression? Or is it anger? Are the particular emotions that have a greater impact on how we perceive or, or react to pain? Well, any emotion, I think, which taps into our defence system is likely to increase our experience of pain you know, if we're expecting something bad, basically. Um, Mm. But this is counterbalanced by the fear system, which can switch pain off. So before I was referring to the studies of soldiers on the battlefield, this switches on a mechanism which is called stress-induced analgesia. Um, It involves the release of endorphins, opiate-like chemicals, from the midbrain and from the spinal cord and these endorphins can actually switch pain messages off temporarily so that strong emotion of fear is enough to um, switch pain off and this has an adaptive function. It means that uh, we can focus our attention on uh, what we need to do to deal with the emergency Mm -hmm. um, instead of being distracted by pain. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. You think about obviously if people are in an accident or something like that, sometimes it kind of mm. takes a while for them to mm. register the pain. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, I've sort of seen this happening in real life. The one and only time I went to a football match, one of the players broke his arm and uh, he continued to play, apparently unconcerned by his broken arm until afterwards. And so that's the opioids that are kind of being released. That's kind mm. of numbing the pain. Wow. Uh, Within the central nervous system, yes, it's opiates which are are blocking pain signals, blocking pain messages from Mm -hmm. um, moving up to the um, thalamus and to the cortex. And so, in a sense, the pain gate has been closed there within the spinal cord. And so we've got then your emotions that obviously affect pain and then also how we perceive the pain, how we think about the pain that will also affect our perception of it and the sensations associated with it. Yeah, that's, that's true. These two aspects combined, thoughts and emotions, are likely to influence our perception of pain. If we're experiencing some form of negative affect, which may or may not be related to the pain, well, this is going to colour our experience of pain. So that mm-hmm. if we're anxious about something else, we're going to be hypervigilant for threats. And by and large, pain is regarded as a threat. And so we're going to then focus our attention upon potential threat and experience a more intense form of pain than we otherwise might. 
Having said that, though, the opposite also happens. If we're expecting to experience some discomfort, well, then it's not a threat to us. So when we exercise, often we're experiencing some discomfort while we exercise and afterwards uh, we might experience some aches and pains, which we just take as you know, the cost of exercising. Yep. And uh, we're unconcerned generally because we understand the source of pain and we understand that it's not a danger, it's not a threat. And so mm. it means that that pain doesn't become important to us. It's something that we can safely ignore. And under those conditions, pain generally is minimal. Other people actually actively induce pain. There seems to be a new trend of people hopping in um, ice water baths and um, yes. if you've actually done this yourself or even if you've put your hand or your foot into a, an ice bath, you'll know that after about 20 or 30 seconds or so, it becomes very, very uncomfortable. But nevertheless, people do this deliberately to experience heightened arousal and sort of the endorphins rush that that type of stimulation may induce. And so it's something that they're prepared to experience. I suppose you could say the same thing about uh, hot saunas. First time you hop into yeah. a hot sauna, um, it can be quite uncomfortable and it can even get to be objectively painful. But people are prepared to experience that sensation because of the um, uh, rewarding effects of the sauna or the ice water bath yeah. afterwards. And under those conditions, pain is not regarded as a threat. In fact, it's expected and it's under our personal control and so is reasonably minimal. Okay, okay. So there's kind of obviously the perception is, is that there's a, some type of reward that, that might be accrued from engaging yeah. in that activity and therefore the sensation is different. Yeah, so it might be a physiological reward. It might be a sense of self-efficacy. By physiological reward, I'm uh, referring to um, the um, arousing effects of saunas or ice water baths or exercising, mm -hmm. which can be pleasurable either during or after that type of experience. Or it could be an emotional reward in that uh, we've done something that was challenging and we're uh, pleased with, with how we went. And so yeah. uh, that then becomes the reward. Um, if you compare that against the types of emotions that we might experience after an injury or even while anticipating or after some form of surgical intervention where we're concerned about the outcome, pain then becomes a signal not of something that we expected but of something which is frightening, which is threatening and therefore becomes a focus of our attention and a trigger for negative emotions. And under those conditions, we're likely to experience more intense pain. I mean, certainly I notice through my clinical experience that when there's an uncertainty as to the source or, or when there's going to be recovery, when will I ever get better, then the, the association of the pain is certainly exacerbated for people. Yes, yes. So if they're uncertain about the future, um, that's mm -hmm. a source of anxiety and so it is then very difficult to let go of pain. So what about people with chronic pain? Are there particular thoughts that people with chronic pain that the research shows can have a negative effect on their, their pain and their recovery? Well, there is a tight link between depression, anxiety and chronic pain. The majority of people with chronic pain have some sort of negative aspect, be it depression, anxiety, anger, or a mixture of, of those. There are quite close links, actually, physiologically between what's happening in chronic pain and what's happening during negative emotions, such as depression or negative moods, such as depression and anxiety. In fact, the link's so close that it involves similar parts of the brain and similar neurotransmitters. So the thoughts that we have when we're depressed are uh, uh, likely to prompt behaviours and to prompt emotions which uh, may inadvertently make pain worse. And that'd be things like, for people who are depressed, the, the issue of catastrophizing, and I've also seen research about pain catastrophizing that can also impact on depressed mood and also the pain sensation. Yes, exactly. It seems that 
pain catastrophizing is one of the predictors of chronic pain. It's, it's not all a one-way street, by the way, that uh, we might catastrophize about pain because of our negative experience of pain. We might develop this hypervigilance towards pain uh, simply because of uh, our recent experience. And there is literature to show that if pain resolves, either through natural means or through treatments which work, negative emotions also resolve. Mm -hmm. But uh, before this happens, there is this two-way link between emotions and pain that experiencing strong emotions can make pain worse and experiencing strong pain can make negative emotions worse. Yep. So there's a bi-directional relationship, isn't there? Mm, mm. And it's bi-directional in the sense that people who are depressed have a higher risk of developing chronic pain if they injure themselves and people who are not depressed. And conversely, people who develop chronic pain are more likely to become anxious or depressed than people who aren't in chronic pain over a similar time span. All right, so obviously that's telling us when we're seeing somebody with chronic pain, we really need to assess for their mood state, their, you know, whether they're depressed, whether they're anxious, because it's certainly going to have an impact on their pain mm. and their recovery. Yeah, so from treatment provider's perspective, uh, these are targets that can be used to help people not only manage their life more effectively in terms of perhaps brightening their mood, but also, secondarily, uh, might change their experience of chronic pain. It can be a means to um, manage pain more effectively. It might mm -hmm. not mean that pain disappears entirely, but it might mean that the person is able to experience more uh, positive affect, you know, a greater sense of control over their pain than they otherwise mm -hmm. would if they're able to manage yeah. negative emotions. Yeah, and then generally function better in life, obviously. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so their well-being is improved. Now, you've done, I know you've done a lot of work on, you know, in headaches and migraines. So obviously what you're mentioning here is that our emotions and our thoughts are going to affect you know, the pain associated with the migraine or with the headache, does though our thoughts and our emotions also increase the likelihood of actually having a migraine, of, of developing a migraine of getting in the first a headache. place? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's psychological stress is regarded by migraine sufferers as you know, the most common trigger for their headaches. Mm -hmm. um, the headache doesn't necessarily start during the stressful period but seems to be associated either with the experience of stress or develops shortly after the stress resolves. I remember back when I was a, a university student and um, collecting data for my PhD, um, this involved interviewing lots and lots of people with different forms of headache and uh, it was quite a common theme that seemed to emerge that people who experienced frequent migraine would say that the headache didn't necessarily come during the period of stress but as soon as they relaxed uh, that's when they were most vulnerable so you know, they might rush around okay. preparing a dinner party, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, the headache wouldn't necessarily develop during that period of psychological stress while they're preparing for the party. It would develop very soon before the guests actually arrived when they actually yeah. wow. had prepared everything and were just taking a breath and waiting for their guests to come just when they were yeah. prepared, preparing to relax and to enjoy themselves. So there must be something about psychological stress that increases vulnerability to headaches. Um, yeah. We explored this actually in um, some of the um, uh, research studies here that have been done mostly by um, my students. And in one of the studies, we tried to induce headaches by means of a stressful experience and uh, about... 50 to 60 percent of our participants actually did develop a headache during the stressful test. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, though, um, people in our control group who'd been selected because they didn't experience headaches, migraine headaches very often, if at all, developed headaches during this form of psychological stress as frequently as people who had migraine headache. Wow. Um, what seemed to 
predict whether they developed a headache or not was the um, sense of self-efficacy that they had about solving the um, stressful task. So those people who tried mm. hardest um, actually experienced the strongest emotions while they were trying to uh, manage the task um, and also experienced the greatest decrease in self-efficacy during the task when they realized that the task was simply insoluble. And we were able to actually track the um, development of the headache against the um, development of negative affect during this task because every five minutes we stopped and asked people to provide mm -hmm. ratings of their mood. And it was very informative in that uh, negative affect developed five or ten minutes before the onset of the headache in most people. So we could see this clear link between a stressful experience, the thoughts that people had about uh, managing that stressful experience, trying but failing, experiencing negative affect, and then developing a headache. So yeah. you know, that's, that's one model that we have of this link between psychological stress and headache. Mm -hmm. In some of my earlier work, um, I was interested in what might be happening to the vascular system uh, when headaches began or during the headache itself. And according to this theory, swelling of scalp blood vessels in particular or intracranial vessels, vessels which supply the brain itself, was potentially a source of pain in migraine headache. And so we were interested in the effects of psychological stress on the response of these blood vessels, whether these blood vessels dilated during psychological stress. And indeed, we found that they did. This didn't necessarily translate immediately into a headache, though. So there must be mm -hmm. um, additional steps there that link this vascular response to the um, development and the experience of a headache. And we think that something goes wrong within the brainstem pain control mm -hmm. processing centers to take the brakes off, basically, yeah. um, the flow of pain signals into the brain. So it's a, a type of a disinhibition process that we normally screen out intense sensations or, or sensations which uh, potentially are unpleasant, unpleasant from our conscious awareness, but during migraine headache, this process fails. And so that as well as experiencing pain from dilated blood vessels, we also experience discomfort from bright light. Mm -hmm. And we also experience discomfort or uh, distorted noise, discomfort from loud noise. So people with migraine headache often prefer to wait it out in a quiet, dark room until the headache is gone. Wow. So, so really then, I mean, obviously, you know, if anybody's seeing someone who's coming with chronic pain, with headaches, migraines, they really need to be asking about their mood. They really need to be asking about their thoughts. And you mentioned self-efficacy, you know, the confidence yeah. in being able to kind of manage a situation. That seems to play a, a big part in pain too, doesn't it? Yeah. And the coping strategies that people use to try to manage psychological stress seem to be important. Um, we need to match an appropriate coping strategy to the um, form of stress that we're facing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if the stress can be regarded as a challenge and we're able to actually meet that challenge then we're not likely to experience strong negative affect. It's only when uh, we try hard and fail uh, where this negative affect builds, where the um, mm -hmm. sense of self-efficacy decreases, which seems to make us vulnerable to headache because somehow that impacts upon the way that we process sensory information. All right. Now, the other question I wanted to ask you about was the relationship between sleep and pain. What's the relationship there? Uh, well, again, it's a reciprocal relationship. So if we suffer from insomnia, we're likely then to be more vulnerable to developing chronic pain. And obviously mm -hmm. the opposite uh, is important too. If we're experiencing pain, it's harder to, to sleep, to you know, pain can wake us up if we move during sleep. Uh, the discomfort that we experience often is enough to wake us up. So 
very frequently people who have chronic pain also have some sort of sleeping problem. Again, you know, we're looking at a complex multifaceted problem that the uh, person in pain has to manage mm-hmm. somehow. In fact, I think from um, a brief look at the literature that about 50% of people with chronic pain also have a sleeping problem. And in people that come to um, pain management programs, the um, prevalence of sleeping problems is even higher. So that in a study that one of my students carried out, the um, prevalence of sleep problems was up around 70 to 80% in the um, participants within these pain management programs run through a a multidisciplinary pain clinic. This has been studied experimentally, you know, this link between pain and sleep. If you deprive people of sleep, uh, they'll become more sensitive to painful stimulation. Mm -hmm. If they sleep well, the opposite happens. So there seems to be, you know, this direct association between adequate sleep and our experience and processing of pain. I actually read a uh, review paper recently and they, were, and they were talking about obviously the relationship between pain and sleep and one of the conclusions was that you know, certainly pain can affect sleep but it seems as though from what I was inferring from it was that sleep can affect pain more than pain can affect sleep. Does, does that make sense? <laughs> yes, um, it might well be so. We found actually in the study that we carried out through the um, pain clinic that people with a sleeping problem who, you know, by definition had chronic pain because they were attending a pain clinic were also likely to be um, depressed and also likely to catastrophize about pain and about negative affect in general. So, you know, they have the full package of negative affect sleep problems and chronic pain. So it's hard to tease out the primary problem, whether it is the pain, whether it is the sleeping disturbance or Mm. whether it is the negative affect. I think they all feed upon each other. So then you've got, obviously, I mean, somebody's coming in with chronic pain, you could treat the chronic pain and then potentially the mood and sleep will improve or alternatively you could treat the sleep or, or treat the mood problem and the pain could kind of improve too. So you could start from a few different areas, couldn't you? You could do the, the pain management, but you could also do the counselling around the kind of mood and the depression and the anxiety, or you could do some sleep hygiene work and you could improve the pain in that way too. Exactly. One important thing I think to include in um, the pain treatment program, pain management program, is some education around how these different components of pain interact with each other so that it's very clear to the uh, person seeking help that they're likely to benefit not only in terms of uh, better sleep if that becomes the the first form of treatment but also that this is likely also to have positive benefits in terms of their pain experience and uh, if they're sleeping better it's also likely to help to lift their mood. And we can actually, through the process of psychoeducation, help the person to feel motivated enough to actually persist with treatment if they understand Mm -hmm. why the treatment is being recommended and why we think it might work and why we think it might work in particular for them, then they're likely to engage more closely in the treatment and likely to benefit more from it. Mm-hmm. So I think that that psychoeducation component is, yeah. is quite critical. Absolutely. And that's the thing because if you, if you start treating the mood or you try, start treating the sleep and not necessarily the pain and they don't understand why you're doing that, it can be quite invalidating potentially for them and yeah. they think, oh, well, not depressed, you know, potentially they drop out or, or not receive the benefits exactly. from treatment. Exactly, exactly. Um, often that is a problem for people being referred from a pain clinic or from a pain specialist or even a GP to a psychologist that they feel like Mm. they're being fobbed off in some way and they have this sense of not being listened to that uh, the doctor or you know the health practitioner has concluded that it's not a physical problem that needs to be treated it's a psychological problem 
And uh, the inference there is that, therefore, they are to blame for their chronic pain. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so this is something also that needs to be addressed early on in treatment. Um, trying to get the point across to explain to the uh, pain sufferer that pain really can't be um, teased out from negative effect pain really can't be teased out from sleep problems if there are sleep problems mm. uh, that are happening in parallel with the experience of pain and because yeah. they can't be teased out if we work on one part of the problem it's likely to have benefits on the other part of the problem yeah. and okay. if they understand and accept that I think uh, you'll increase the likelihood of the uh, person benefiting from treatment substantially. Well, yeah, I mean, certainly agree. So that psychoeducation is imperative. And I did read that 85% of the time, there's no definitive peripheral cause of, you know, with people with chronic back pain, 85% of the time they, they can't find a physical cause. So, um, and mm. then that can, you know, if, if that psychoeducation is not happening, then that can be quite invalidating. They're going, oh, it's all in my mm. head. And it is in your head. It's mm. the, the brain triggers, you know, it's obviously the brain's response yes. to the pain sensation. Yes, yes, exactly. And, you know, there's the inference, again, that if pain is in my head, it's my fault for experiencing pain. Yeah. But uh, that's not necessarily true. We know that pain can be operantly conditioned and that this process can happen outside of our conscious awareness. You know, the experimental literature is quite clear on this, that signals which aren't painful can be experienced as inducing pain if pain has been conditioned in the sense mm -hmm. that pain is presented at the same time as that signal, as that warning. This can actually evoke not only an alarm response, but a physical sensation of pain in some people. Yep. It's interesting, you, you sent a, uh, a paper to us looking at the pain reprocessing therapy and it, you know, just some of the outcomes that they had was 66% you know, yeah. of the people who were randomised to so a four-week pain reprocessing therapy were pain-free or nearly pain-free at post-treatment compared to yeah. only 10% who were receiving randomised or were randomised to usual care. Yes, and, th and that's, that's a fantastic outcome. Absolutely. Yeah, the focus of this treatment was changing beliefs about pain away from back pain as a source of threat to um, uh, reconceptualizing that sensation that they experience as non-threatening. And once people actually took that on board and believed or changed their beliefs around pain, uh, that seemed to be the green light in terms of actually coming to terms with Mm -hmm. their pain and actually doing things which previously they had avoided because uh, they were frightened that that would make their pain worse. Part of the um, problem in people with chronic pain is this very natural desire to avoid things which might hurt. The difficulty for the person is actually um, working out uh, whether their beliefs are true or not. And <laughs> Part of psychological treatment is encouraging people to actually go ahead and test their beliefs about what hurts and what doesn't hurt and about mm -hmm. the meaning they attach to feelings of pain if it does hurt. We talk about good pain and bad pain, you know, the examples that I gave previously about exercising, you know, that's a good form of pain, um, about the painful sensations that we might experience during physiotherapy or during ice water baths or saunas as being a, a good mm -hmm. form of pain, non-threatening pain. We can actually reconceptualize the pain that we might be experiencing in our back or in our neck as potentially a good form of pain rather than as a threatening pain. It might be that the muscles around our back, when we think certain thoughts, start to tighten up and the source mm -hmm. of pain that we're experiencing is from uh, muscles protecting what we assume is a weakened part of our body. If we go ahead and test out whether that part of our body is in fact um, sound or not, we might find out that uh, our body's actually working better than we thought, we might mm -hmm. then have the confidence to go ahead and try new activities that previously we had avoided. And that seems to be the um, the key to then getting back into a, a more um, pain-free state. Yeah. 
So obviously if a practitioner is seeing somebody with chronic pain, obviously assessing mood and they could use something like the, uh, I suppose, the depression, anxiety and stress scale to assess the severity of their mood, obviously asking about their mood and so forth. Yeah. They need to assess for sleep and there's various sleep-related questionnaires that they could do. Are there any specific yeah. pain-related questionnaires or assessments that you would recommend practitioners use? Well, there's the the brief pain inventory. This is a fairly short form uh, to assess you know, the person's pain experience over the past week or so, I think. So that's worth looking into. The pain catastrophizing scales, it's very widely used, so it's been well validated. I'd recommend a disability questionnaire such as the Oswestry or the, the Roland Morris scales um, to work out how pain might be impacting on the person's day-to-day -day activities. And another one that I would add to the um, list would be a scale that one of my PhD students developed recently, the pain invalidation scale. Um, okay. because this actually taps into this sense of feeling not listened to or not being believed, not only by healthcare practitioners but also by immediate others that might inadvertently impact upon the person's self-confidence or colour their mood. We included in this pain invalidation scale also a subscale dealing with self-invalidation because often people are very critical about themselves for being too weak to um, do things that they believe that they should be able to do. And these negative beliefs can then have flow-on effects in terms of negative mood. Mm -hmm. So I think that recognising that many people in chronic pain will have negative views about themselves and will have experienced negative interactions with others because they're in pain it needs to be recognised by healthcare practitioners and needs mm -hmm. to be built into any form of intervention. All right, so we'll definitely add uh, put links to all those all those questionnaires okay. in the show notes. They sound like some great ideas. I mean, I suppose the other one I've seen is the pain self-efficacy scale too, which is sometimes oh, yes, I've seen. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Okay, now obviously you have talked about thoughts, we talked about emotions. Just a question about, you know, relaxation, the potential of kind of relaxation treatments and relaxation therapies and manage chronic pain. Are there, you got any comments on relaxation? Well, relaxation obviously is a useful tool for, for managing emotions. It's a mm. useful tool for inducing physical relaxation, you know, karma physiological state in terms of slowed breathing and decreased heart rate and blood pressure, etc., which can also uh, then flow on to um, feeling a greater sense of control over our body. And I think it's this sense of control which is, is quite useful in terms of managing our sensations and interpreting those sensations as threatening or not. If we have a sense of control, we're less likely to be frightened about pain or less likely to be anxious about pain. And uh, then this translates into actually experiencing less pain. It becomes self-fulfilling. So I think that relaxation strategies such as controlled breathing, progressive mm -hmm. muscle relaxation can be useful. Yep. One caveat with muscle relaxation is to um, be careful around the site of injury or site of previous injury um, because the tissues there might be quite sensitive to movement, to muscle movement. So part of the um, pro progressive muscle relaxation process is to tense and to relax muscles so that we can distinguish between the sensations of a tense versus relaxed muscle group. Mm. This needs to be done quite carefully around the um, area of injury to make sure that we don't inadvertently increase painful sensations when we're intending to produce a more comfortable state. Have you tried um, any experience with biofeedback? I mean, what's your thoughts about biofeedback as a potential option? It depends what form that feedback takes. So if we're wanting to decrease physiological arousal, we might target, for instance, 
some aspect of the cardiovascular system. So we might give feedback around heart rate or heart rate variability. Or it might be that uh, we're wanting the person to target their breathing, in which case we might measure their breathing and give feedback about uh, when they're breathing regularly versus when they're not. And these biofeedback messages can be helpful for people to um, see whether they're on track or not, but whether what they're doing in terms of their behaviours, their thoughts, their emotions is actually translating into what they are aiming to achieve in terms of reduced physiological or psychological arousal. We can target particular muscle groups if those muscle groups are found to be a source of tension or a source of pain and um, help the person to relax those particular muscle groups through providing feedback about how tense or how relaxed those groups are at any instant in time. And so uh, feedback can be used effectively there as well. Wow. All right. So we're really then, I mean, I think you've provided us with lots of great information about obviously the link between thoughts and emotions and pain, whether it be acute or, or chronic. The, the reality is that if we're seeing anybody with chronic pain, we really need to kind of assess their mood and, and treat it accordingly. You need to assess their sleep and treat it accordingly. Certain thoughts that they may have and we can change some of the thoughts that they have around pain and change, kind of, I suppose, their relationship they have with pain, that's going to have dramatic effects. And obviously a lot of natural practitioners there, uh, including different herbs, anti-inflammatory herbal ingredients and, and diets and, and all those components too, and that we as psychologists don't necessarily do so much. But I think collectively, if you put it all together, we can really get some, some really nice outcomes with yes. people with experiencing yes, chronic yes. pain. I, I think so too. Uh, I think there's a real role for... Uh, a range of healthcare practitioners to help people with chronic pain because pain is such a a multifaceted problem. Um, People with different expertise can um, uh, help uh, in their area of expertise, but it's also really important to be aware of um, other areas in which the patient might benefit and working within a multidisciplinary team is ideal. All right, well, thank you very much, Peter, for you know, taking the time out to, uh, to provide us with your you know, years of experience. I know, um, I know you've been around for a while, so you, you taught me when I was uh, doing my master's. So, that's, uh, so what are you, yeah. about 35 now, aren't you? Um, well, a little <laughs> older than 35. I'm not quite double 35, but nearly. <laughs> 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 All right, but yeah, no, certainly, uh, you know, uh, through the throughout the years, you know, in terms of the, the knowledge that you've given me, um, and uh, obviously, yeah. you know, the expertise and the papers that you've published and the research that you've done in the, particularly in the area of pain has been amazing. So, so certainly, thank you uh, very much for joining us today. Thanks, Adrian. All right, so thank you everyone for listening today. Don't forget that you can find all the show notes, transcripts, and other resources from today's episode on the FX Medicine website. I'm Dr. Adrian Lepresti, and thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. This podcast is intended as healthcare practitioner education only, and it is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Did you know Bioceuticals has a clinic only range? developed for exclusive use by clinicians. This product range offers complex formulas, high doses, and specific ingredients for specialised cases. Bioceuticals Clinical infuses quality, credibility, innovation, and professionalism into an exclusive product range that meets the needs and demands of private clinicians. Visit bioceuticals.com.au to learn more.